Great. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to kick off this afternoon's session with um, Evelyn Leeson and the Dunemer Guild and Beatrice Kelly. Now, Beatrice, and I'll just give you her biography, is a great, great niece of Evelyn Gleeson and grew up in Dublin, surrounded by stories and objects of the Dunemer Guild. Am I actually pronouncing that right? Dunemer. Dunemer. Dunemer Guild. So, the relief and pronunciation is Dunemer. So, um, she has worked in the heritage sector since 1992 in Ireland and also at a European level. At present, she works in Ancoria Oroctha. Okay, I got that bit right anyway. And the Heritage Council as head of policy and research. Beatrice is presenting on behalf of her father, Patrick Kelly, and herself. And is your father here with us today? Yes. He is? Oh, there's. Ah, right, okay. So Beatrice's father is down here, Patrick Kelly, in the front. So, ladies and gentlemen, can you please give a warm welcome to Beatrice Kelly? Thanks very much, Morris, and um, thanks in particular to Michael for this opportunity to tell you a little bit about the female Gleasons, um, and um, in a way to tell you a, a story of perhaps one of somebody who's perhaps been a little bit neglected or maligned in certain quarters. So it's great to have this opportunity to explain to her cousins um, a bit about what actually happened, um, just to explain in a way the hard work on this presentation has been done by my father Patrick um, and so hence both names here. So just to start off, the Dunema Guild, um, although it's always written as Dunema, it's always been said anyway um, as, as Dunema, um, was started by Evelyn Gleeson in 1902 and it was one of the most outstanding arts and crafts enterprises in Ireland in the first half of the 20th century. As the other two leading figures of the day were Lily and Lolly Yates, sisters of the poet W.B. Yeats, and also the painter, obviously, Jack B. It is very notable being an enterprise almost entirely run and organized by women. The guild produced carpets and tapestries, and I think I have something here, yes, to give you a little um, picture of what they, sort of some of the early work they did. Um, distinguished by Celtic designs and colors, and they also produced high handset printing works of, by leading poets, of the first decade of the 20th century, particularly W.B. Yeats and high quality embroidery work. Its output also extended to ecclesiastical vestments, book binding, leatherwork, enamelling, Celtic style clothing, and on a, to a lesser scale, silverwork and furniture. During the First World War, the Guild took part in the realization of something that is regarded as the high point of Irish arts and crafts, that is the Honan Chapel, some of you may know it well, down in UCC. Um, it also enjoyed the patronage of the new Irish state when they made the, some of the carpet in Dáil Éireann and also produced the carpet which was the official Irish gift to Pope Pius XI at the first Dublin Eucharistic Congress in 1932. But sadly, much of this achievement, along with Evelyn's important contribution to the training of arts and crafts workers in Ireland, has been somewhat overshadowed, or largely overshadowed, by the obsession with the bitter quarrels that arose between her and the Yates sisters. Um, they always used to refer to her after the row as Miss Gleeson, to sort of keep her at some distance. Um, so for nearly 80 years, the actual situation, the circumstances of this split were really only known from the Yates side. And the blame for the inability of making this work was left firmly at the door of that old Devlin, devil, Evelyn Gleeson, as their father, John B. Yates, referred to her. The first person to actually sort of uncover the reality of what went on was Sheila Pym, who was writing a biography of Evelyn's close friend and partner in setting up the guild, the renowned botanist Augustine Henry. Since then, another, other, quite a lot of other studies have, have sort of continued um, sort of telling the story differently, and particularly that by William Michael Murphy called Family Secrets, William Butler Yates and his relatives showing in particular how the initial misunderstandings and unrealistic expectations exacerbated by the difficulty of three strong-willed women tried to conduct a large-scale artistic enterprise on a shoestring led to hostility and incomprehension of each other's difficulties, culminating in what can only be described as mutual hatred that really made the parting of ways inevitable. 
But today, we're going to try and avoid rehashing a lot of these hostilities and try and take a fresh look at what Evelyn Gleeson and the Guild achieved in this period. We'll also look a little bit, obviously, given the interest and where we are, um, of her connections to this part of the world where she was very proud of her Gleeson heritage and in particular had a strong attachment to this part of the world and the countryside close to Loch Derg. So, just hopping on a bit, um, she was born in Knutsford in Cheshire in England in, on the 15th of May 1855 and she died in Dunemer, the house, in Dundrum in Dublin in 1944. Her father was Edward Maloney Gleeson, of whom we're going to hear more um, this afternoon. Um, and he, in turn, uh, was the son of Michael Gleeson, another Michael Gleeson, um, of Kilcomen, close to here, near Drummondier. So obviously, I'm not going to go into that at all. I leave that up to Michael. So, but Evelyn, although she, at times she has been referred to as English, had, she wasn't, and she never regarded herself as that. And she had always very close ties to Ireland. So from a very small age, two or three years old, she was regularly visiting her family in Kilcolman. And her memories, which she wrote up, her memoirs in her 80s, she vividly recalls these childhood days at Kilcolman with her Maloney aunts and uncles and the tales she heard from people in the locality. She shows a great sort of attachment to place and belonging that, that remained with her all her life. In particular, Loch Derg, with its wooded, temporary shores and distant mountains, seemed to exert a powerful hold on her imagination and her affections. She, as well, was also very interested in family genealogy. But the most important thing, really, that happened in her early life was her father's decision to retire from medical practice in England and to come back to Ireland to set up some form of industry that would provide employment on a large scale. Because in 1857, when he was travelling with his brother-in-law, James Simpson, they visited Athlone one day on a fair day and were horrified by the number of destitute people that they saw. So they decided to go into partnership to try and set up some sort of enterprise, settling on a wooden mill, which eventually became the main source of employment in the town. So from 1863, they were permanently resident in Athlone, and it was there that she had, Evelyn received her early education, finishing with two years in the Ursuline Convent in Sligo, in 1869 to 71, where various Maloney aunts and great aunts were or had been members of that community. She then went on to um, London, where she qualified as a school teacher, although she never actually taught, she never she took it up as a career. But in the late 1870s, her elder brother, well, not her elder brother, but her, the oldest of her brothers, Jim, uh, to whom she was especially close, was attended college in what was then Queen's College in Galway, now UCG studying for science and then Greek and Roman classics. During this time, she kept house for him um, in Galway, meeting a lot of his friends and taking part in intellectual discussions. In some ways, experiencing the closest thing you could have to experiencing college life for women at that time. Most important of these friends was a young Ulsterman called Augustine Henry, who was also studying science. Along with Jim Gleason, Augustine Henry entered the colonial service by joining the Chinese customs after qualifying as a medical doctor. Once in China, he embarked on the study of botany, and over the next 20 years, he became one of the most distinguished of European plant collectors. In 1884, the Gleasons moved to Benown, from Hill House, their house in Athlone, to Benown, which is outside Glasson, just quite close to, to Loch Reeve. But in 18, 1887, however, tragedy struck the family, with Jim Gleason's death at the hands of the Dacoits in the Second Burma War in India. Evelyn and Augustine Henry were brought close together by their mutual grief and their ensuing correspondence is one of the most important sources of information on Henry's personal life and thoughts for the remainder of his time in China. In 1881, 91, sorry, um, Evelyn returned to London to study art with Albert Ludovici, who was a close friend of Whistler and very much impressed, um, influenced by the Impressionists, and in particular Degas. He was sufficiently impressed by Evelyn to ask her to join his atelier in 1896, but then she was far more interested in design rather than art. And she went on to study design in the South Kensington Museum Schools, which is a precursor of the Royal College of Art. She went on to produce carpet patterns bought by a large carpet company, Templeton's of Glasgow, whose own professional designer was very sort of taken with her designs and encouraged her. Thanks to a trust fund set up by her father, who had died in 1896, she was financially independent and played an increasingly um, active role in the artistic and literary circles in London, 
becoming, for example, the first secretary, the founding secretary of the Irish Literary Society set up by W.B. Yeats, attending the Gaelic League, and also an early member of the Pioneer Club, which was a sort of progressive club for women. By the turn of the century, um, she, however, by, sorry, by the turn, yeah, it's actually the start of the 20th century, she was, had less, London had less attraction for her. She was in her mid-40s, she had chronic ill health, and had had some, uh, undergone a major operation. Augustine Henry, too, who is here on, on the left, um, has now left the Chinese customs and was in, increasingly interested in forestry with a long-term vision to set up the forestry industry here in Ireland. So early in 1902, they decided to put into action an idea that had long attracted them, setting up an arts and crafts enterprise in Dublin that would provide employment through using Irish hands and Irish material and the making of beautiful things, their own quotation, but would also embody a strong philanthropic and educational dimension. The idea of providing employment, particularly for women through craft industries, was well established here. Over, sort of over a century or more, particularly you can take the lace making enterprises in Limerick, Kenmare, New Ross, and other ventures such as the workshops producing Killarney ware, um, with now sort of stereotyped Irish decoration in the form of harps, shamrocks, wolfhounds, and other enterprises like Alice Hart's Donegal Industries and Belique Potteries. They produced objects that reached out to a middle class market through the sales of, of work under aristocratic patronage and assorted trade fairs. Evelyn Gleeson and Augustine Henry, however, wanted to base their sort of their products on a far more genuine historical inspiration, seeking patterns and designs from the Book of Kells and other authentic sources, reaching back to an idealized culture that they believed had been subverted by the Normans. They also combined nationalist aspirations with socialist ideals from William Morris, rejecting crude, machine-made objects in favor of beautiful things produced by hand from natural materials. So in Evelyn Gleeson's terms, that meant Irish paper for the books they printed, Irish linen for the embroidery, and Irish wool for the tapestry, and using sort of traditional plant-based dyes for the colours. The products were intended for the mass of people, but in point of fact, none of the people who actually worked at Dunema would have ever been able to afford the objects they produced. But that was a situation actually common to many of these arts and crafts enterprises sort of everywhere. Her specific contribution, there was a proto-feminist perspective, seeing in craft training a means for Irish girls to find productive, relatively well-paid work here in Ireland that would avoid emigration. Very often, quite a lot of the, the lace industries there were set up to help people earn the fare to go to America. So this is about trying to keep people here. Um, also trying to broaden the cultural horizons of the people in Dunema. Uh, so they were offered Irish language classes, painting classes, and drama what Evelyn called the possibility of nationalizing others through the eyes as well as through the ears. So while some discussion may have gone on with W.B. Yeats about setting up a press in Ireland, the real sort of project or settlement, as Evelyn and Augustine termed it, was entirely their own idea, their own brainchild. After approaches to other friends had failed, only then did they actually contact the Yeats sisters. And unfortunately, the approach to the Yates came through Augustine Henry rather than through Evelyn, who in practical terms was actually in charge of the whole idea, and this was a state of affairs that the Yates never really fully accepted. The financial basis of the project was completely away from the start. This is Lily and Lolly Yates here. Um, although Evelyn enthusiastically endorsed her father's idea about the need to create employment here, she lacked his sort of sense of business reality. And the Yates sisters were keen to come back and have a new fresh start in Dublin, but they actually had no money, they had no capital to contribute. Even They also needed an income to keep them going until they actually started generating any money or any income from the, the new guild. So Augustine Henry provided them this substantial sum at that time of £500 to cover an income for them, an annual income for them for a couple of years, as well as a small contribution to the start-up costs. The rest of the costs were provided by Evelyn. But unfortunately, for all concerned, Evelyn, who had also taken on responsibility for her widowed sister Constance and the latter's three children, she was essentially, um, although prejudiced in places, she was also quite a generous and kindly person and was reluctant to spell out the financial sort of realities of the situation that the sisters were entirely dependent on her. And she promoted the notion of a cooperative venture 
where each of the three women would be independently responsible for their department. So Lily was in charge of embroidery, Lolly of printing, and Evelyn in charge of weaving. And that they would all each undertake their own training and education of the girls. And the women, in return, the girls, the employees, would, uh, for a minimum wage, receive the training in this skill, but they would also get some more general education, we were talking about including Irish language. And training was an important part of the whole scheme um, and of the finances, um, because Evelyn's cousin, T.P. Gill, was secretary of the Department of Agriculture and Technical Training at the time and approved a number of grants that sort of contributed to the Guild as well. Um, as has been noted in other places, some of the girls remained at the Guild on completion of their training, they stayed on. Um, though never at enormous wages, it has to be said, um, while others went on to success in other spheres, particularly uh, one of the most notable ones is Mary Walker, who's known really as Maura Nishuli, and she was the original Peggy Mike in Singh's Playboy of the Western World, and she stayed at she a friend of Evelyn for the rest of Evelyn's life. So while the Yates, I'm oh, sorry, Evelyn seemed to have believed that while the Yates didn't have any money themselves, they knew people who might be able to help them fund the guild. And likewise, then the Yates sisters were under the impression that Evelyn was perhaps far more wealthy than she really was. A number of Evelyn's friends told her really she shouldn't go into a partnership model, she should have some sort of company model, and she ignored this, which in a way she overcommitted herself in a manner that later on she would greatly regret. So in the summer of 2000, sorry, 2019, <laughs> Um, Augustine Henry and Evelyn Gleeson chose a house outside Dublin, south of Dublin, in, near Dundrum, um, which was then called Runnymede, and it offered space for workrooms and also for Evelyn's family, her, her, her sister and, and nieces and nephew. And the place was renamed Dunema in honour of um, Cuvallon's wife, Ama, who was very famed for her, her skill in embroidery. So money was essentially what, or the lack of money really, was fundamentally what led to the breakup of the guild, first into the division of the guild and industries, only two years later, so they already had difficulties from the outset, where Evelyn kept her weaving and tapestry enterprise, and then the Yates sisters had separate responsibility for their press and the embroideries, and then four years later, complete breakup, so the Yates go off and set up the cooler press and industries. But the bitterness of the split is not just, I mean, lots of businesses break up, you know, but it was very, very bitter, and it seems to be really due to a sort of irretrievable clash of personalities between, in particular, Evelyn and Lolly Yates, or Elizabeth. She was particularly difficult, as um, William Murphy in his book has actually commented. It is not unfair to say that Miss Gleeson, although not easy to get along with, might have succeeded with someone other than Lolly as a partner but that Lolly would not have succeeded with anyone. So that's, you know, <laughs> really clear. But, you know, let's get away from the split. In the difficult years that they had together, they were some really remarkable achievements across all three departments of the Dunema enterprise. The bread and butter work of the guilds depended on small-scale purchases by middle-class buyers to, brought to monthly at homes um, at Dunema and elsewhere where the goods were displayed. And then the whole enterprise was open to callers whenever they wished to call in. Um, one of the early achievements were these series of banners, quite close here on the other side of the lake, um, in Loch Ray, in St. Brendan's Cathedral, where they did 24 banners. Um, a lot of them were designed by Jack B. Yates and his wife. Um, interestingly, although the Yates were apparently quite hostile to the fact that Evelyn was Catholic, uh, which they voiced to each other, and um, they didn't seem to mind that she commissioned from the Catholic Church either. 1903 also was the, first uh, was the time of the first book that was issued by the Dunema Press, which was W.B. Yeats' In the Seven Woods, which was a remarkably attractive looking book. I'm sorry I wasn't able to find a picture of it to show you. Um, produced, as Lolly, Lake, Lolly Yates said, solely by, the help of, by her with the help of two village girls. However, in financial times, it was not a success, with only 325 copies sold out, um, but it didn't sort of break even. The other irony as well is that WB's dictatorial conception of his own editorial role and disregard for the business side of publishing, such as meeting deadlines or respecting other authors' independence over their own works, um, were as stressful for Lolly as her own relations with Evelyn. Interestingly, um, Evelyn herself was actually an excellent publicist and marketer of the Dunema goods, um, 
Besides the prospectuses that she brought out in 1903 and 4, she arranged for frequent articles in the newspapers, some written directly by herself and other in the form of interviews. And I just want to see, it is a, yes, this is just a view. Um, you see, this is the carpet workshop in, in Dunema, the girls working away on different tapestry carpet rooms and things. And um, although she has been accused, uh, Evelyn has been accused of some snobbery, sort of chasing titled patrons, um, this was one of the most effective ways to try and sell the things, to sell the brand. Um, you know, people read that Daisy, Countess of Fingal, or the Viceroy Lady Aberdeen, had purchased a Dunema carpet or embroidery. It was that this would whet the appetites for other people to try and sort of buy this and get a little bit of glamour, as it were, in the way now that film stars and sort of other celebrities are used to, to advertise goods as well. But the main selling point was really through trade fairs in Dublin, where they regularly took a stand at the arts and crafts industry section in the horse show, and abroad in Chicago in 1904, Milan 1906, and New York in 1909, where the Dunema Guild products won a number of medals. So this is just a little view to show you what their craft fairs were like, sort of piled high, looks like something from a sort of bazaar somewhere. Um, they also um, had, they also would put on show as well major sort of commissions they had, such as sort of, um, you know, vestments. They had some amazing vestments they made for Lockray early on as well. But the final split was occasioned by competition between the two sides over sponsorship for a trip to, the, to America in, 19, in late 1907 to advertise the products of the two branches of Dunema. A successful sales production in New York with the promise of American support for the future convinced Lily Yates that her industries were now in a position to survive effectively on their own. Knowing that Evelyn Gleason's trip had been disappointing, she decided on to make a final break and told Lolly to remove the industries from Dunema. Once Lolly had found an alternative premises quite close down the road, the flip took place, but such was the weight of the actual printing press, they were unable to remove it. And Evelyn subsequently refused to let them have it. This miscalculation effectively stymied the sisters' business and the advantage now passed to Evelyn. Under the terms of how they divided things up in 1904, she was entitled to sue for any money that were left outstanding to her and in fact no, she hadn't had any payment from them, um, so that Yates had to submit to her terms which in the end actually turned out to be really quite generous. Um, they, were, she, they weren't allowed to use the name, Dunema, and the, not to compete directly on any of the actual goods that they produced, like tapestries or carpets or book binding. And their debts, though, were effectively written off. And they also, in the end, they got that press. And they also got the people who worked with it. So this was a, really a sort of um, a capital subvention, which in present day terms would co come to about 100 150,000 euros. An endowment whose generosity has been pointed out by William Murphy, they never really showed any awareness of. Though Evelyn could ill afford to lose such a large sum, she was actually convinced that this was a sacrifice worth making for the sake of her sanity and also for the life of her family, as well as the independent future of the guild itself. So, following the split and the Yates' establishment of the entirely separate cooler industries, do name it slowly re-established itself as a major producer of hand handicrafts. In 1912, she decided to lease out the name of house itself, and then the workshops of the guild that she moved into the city centre to Hardwick Street, where she herself moved um, into to Bowles Bridge. Her nieces, Kitty and Grace McCormick, were now adults. Kitty had studied at the Dublin Metropolitan Schools, and she increasingly took on the role of the designer for the guild in a style somewhat different from Evelyn's, but by the end of this decade, she had replaced her. By the early 1920s, she was now the principal designer. Moving into the inner suburbs brought the family into touch with advanced political nationalism, though in Dundrum they had been neighbours of the Plunkets, Joe being a special favourite with the family. Evelyn Gleeson's sister, Con, had sent her younger daughter, Grace, to St. Dieter's, the, the girls' school associated with Pierce's and Enders. And the guild had helped out with costumes for the pageants in the school, and it was actually from the guild that Thomas McDonough, of this parish, um, obtained his saffron kilts as well. So, um, so, there's actually no indication that Evelyn herself actually sympathised with the idea of armed rising. It has recently come to light that this banner, which is the starry plough flag of the Irish Citizen Army that flew over the Imperial Hotel opposite the GPO during um, Easter week 1916, it was actually embroidered by the Guild. 
In addition to the banners that the guilds produced for churches and religious sodalities, they also turned out a number of trade union banners, including that of the Irish Women's Workers' Union in 1919. Evelyn, too, remained on friendly terms with Roger Casement, as he publicly manifested the advanced nationalist views that actually led to other members of her family to break with him. While Casement greatly annoyed Lolly Yates by saying loudly at a party, I like Miss Gleason. And as mentioned earlier, um, the guild played a significant role in the production then of vestments and other textiles for the Honan Chapel, which is the, the main masterpiece of, of the arts and crafts movement. In the 1920s, Evelyn and her family moved back to Dunema, though the workshop stayed in the city centre and Hardwick Street, where they stayed till the 1950s. One of the most important commissions they had in the 1920s was a complete set of vestments in incredibly lavish styles of cloth of gold and things that was woven in Dublin um, that was for St. Patrick's Church in San Francisco. Put on exhibition in America, and um, they, sorry, before they went to America, they were put on exhibition in Dublin, and the vestments received much favourable comment within the newspapers. And another notable achievement was the manufacture of hand-tufted carpets for Leinster House, in both the Dahl and the Senate chambers. So, what do I have here? Yes, so that gives you a little idea of some of the things they're producing in the 1920s. Um, there's this rather amazing sort of Celtic garb. This is a, a carpet done by Kitty McCormack. And then this is a Celtic revival dress, which is actually worn by uh, May, Mary Kennedy, who was married to the Chief Justice, or what? Yeah. Hugh Kennedy. Yeah. Hugh Kennedy, exactly. Um, and she's actually a distant cousin of theirs as well, a distant cousin. Um, and in fact, you can see that in the National Museum, Collins Barracks, um, if you're passing through Dublin. So the guild, um, Evelyn died in 1944 at Dunayman, and the guild continued on for another two further decades, though on a much smaller scale. The house itself was sold in 1947 and was pulled down to housing development in the early 1970s. Carpet production stopped in the later 1950s with the sale of that part of the business to Donegal Carpets Limited. And then what remained of the guilds then moved to a basement in Harcourt Street, where the main staple was producing badges for the army. In 1964, the enterprise finally came to an end. So born during the Crimean War, Evelyn died towards the end of the Second World War in February 1944. Despite her, early, her, her frequent ill health in middle age, she pr proved a remarkable survivor, outliving all her siblings but one, my great-grandmother Ethel. On the other, of the others involved in the founding of the guild, only Lily still survived, finally succumbing in 1949. It would be nice to, it, to be able to state that time had healed the rift going back to 1908, but on learning of Evelyn's death, Lily had expressed nothing but satisfaction. However, without Evelyn, as William Murphy has pointed out, there would have been no Dunema Guild, no Dunema Press, and later no Kula Press or Industries. And the lives of the Yates, not merely those whom James Joyce termed the Weird Sisters, but also, to a lesser extent, those of W.B. and Jack B. Yates themselves, might have run a very different course. Evelyn Gleeson, however, was not simply defined by the guild, still less by the quarrels with the Yates. To focus too much on those six early contentious years diminishes her significant contribution to Irish art and design, both through her own productions and her often overlooked work as a teacher and trainer of craft workers. Nor should it be forgotten she was a skillful watercolorist and flower painter and creator of portraits and pastels, including this self-portrait, probably done in the years immediately before the guild was established in 1902. Her greatest forte as a designer was probably her remarkable sense of colour. As Kitty McCormack has pointed out, she brought out the colours of the countryside around Dunema, the soft blues, the purples, the browns and greens, successfully into her pieces, thus determining what has become to be known as Irish colouring. Happily to relate, Evelyn and the guilds she founded now feature prominently in, a, in accounts of the Irish arts and crafts movement. And as recently as February 2016, they recorded a significant place in the striking exhibition, Making It Irish, put on by the Mullen Museum in Boston College in the States, devoted to the movement. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard, for a fantastic lecture. Really
interesting to have uh, the arts and crafts movement featured in today's discussions because we've had uh, touched on World War One, we've touched, touched on 1916 as well. Um, what was Beatrice's? Uh, what was she doing in 1916, and how did the events of 1916 and World War One affect her personally? Ooh, um, <laughs> I might have to ask my father to answer on that. I suppose it's quite mixed. Um, I don't know that she recorded anything uh, of what she felt about 1916 in the papers that survived. Uh, she certainly was living in Dublin at that time. And uh, I know that she was uh, very upset by the executions. I mean, there are, are things uh, related to that. And uh, there are sort of uh, almost relics of uh, Joe Puckett, for example. So that uh, it must have been a terrible sort of in personal terms as well as in the national terms. And um, she uh, was quite uh, affected by the war as well. She was very concerned about uh, families that had lost uh, uh, sons uh, to uh, battle and that sort of thing. And um, she had very strength in fact, we did lose people in the time. Thanks, Murphy. Just um, that's a comment. First question is, when is her biography going to be written? <laughs> it's now well known to you. <laughs> it disappointed me when I often read in the papers the list of the ten best men and ten best women in the country. Evelyn Deason doesn't get a mention. And I think she should be up there. Uh, she was very, like the employment she gave, involved in the Celtic Revival, and promoted Irish, Irish crafts at the time, you know, which was so important to when the thinking was changing, when we were beginning to get our feet in this country. And um, I think she should be listed there among the top ten people. Um, just another little side mark, she bought the Nemer, known uh, as Running Me before that. The previous owner was a man called Jane uh, Gillis. He was the, the owner of the Freeman Journal, and a well-known beekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> In fact, he did, <laughs> and he, he wrote he wrote that many articles on, on beekeeping. So, so it was just, just interesting. And I was I was in London there a couple of years. Uh, I go over to Weybridge, and I can see it's, it's the district of running me as well. So it's amazing the connection. So, um, Fabulous. so any any other questions for Beatrice? We have a, a question here in the front uh, from Paddy Waldron. It was a fascinating talk. I've never heard of Evelyn um, Gleason before now, but as you talked about the Simpsons, I realised I read a little bit about the fact in her flow that her aunt, I think, was married to Daniel Doyle, who was one of the Young Ireland leaders in 1848. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. 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 I was referred to the family story over here. The, the nationalism goes way back. Yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, mother's younger sister, who was of course also uh, married to Dan Doyle. Uh, not quite in those days, I think, as distinguished a figure that he later became. I think he ended up as a judge, which was a surprising sort of uh, future, as it were, for a young man. Okay, he, he also spent, I think, three years in Turkey, didn't he? He escaped from Ireland by boat after the this, uh, failed rising and uh, was picked up by a ship which brought him to Turkey. He hid out, he hid out in the amphitheatre in City Key for some time before they got him to carry the hose, along yeah. with O'Donnell and O'Gorman, I think, and the other two. Yeah. And O'Gorman, I think, settled in New York, and I think the other two eventually made their way back to Ireland. So that's a very colourful story in its own way. Yes. And, and, yeah. and uh, their son, another Daniel Doyle, I think, became the Registrar General of Births, Marriages and Deaths. So, so I believe, yes. Yeah. Very interesting point of view. Another son was, uh, I think, a Jesuit. Yeah. Yes. Just, I think, how all that meeting came about was um, her brother, Dr. Edward Gleason, who was speaking about later, and his wife, Harriet Simpson, yeah. and her sister, who later married then and died. They were uh, on holidays in Munster, in, in, in Limerick, and they called on 
which is the car we saw supposed to be part of the morning. And there was some school event on in an open college here, I can't think of the name of the college. And um, the future Mrs. Guy um, was so taken by the events there that she continued her education in that college. And um, that's how she met Danny Guy and eventually um, converted to, to Roman Catholic religion to the horror of her family back. I think her mother sent for her or wrote for to return the week. <laughs> I read that in, in some, of, some of the dying books. Yes, I, I heard that story, I believe it's true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But of course, her, her elder sister, who married him, she also went to the Catholic as well. Great. Well, yeah, can we put our hands together for a wonderful talk from Jesus Christ and Patrick Kelly. Thank you very much.